Well, welcome to our gathering, but I have a question. How many of you here believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Can I see a show of hands? Well, praise God, that's great, but why? Why do you believe it's the Word of God? You and I glibly cling to that. In fact, we're gambling our eternity on that. But it's interesting, not everybody believes that, and you're going to need to know why you believe that, because I think dark times are coming. I have an interesting article that was handed to me yesterday. The headline says, The Catholic Church No Longer Swears by Truth of the Bible. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church has published a teaching document instructing the faithful that some parts of the Bible are not actually true. The Catholic bishops of England, Wales, and Scotland are warning their five million worshipers, as well as many others, drawn uh, to the study of Scripture, that they should not expect total accuracy from the Bible, and that goes on and on to indicate that some of it's not really true, and it's, 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 it's very useful but not accurate, and on it goes. Very typical of many denominational statements, and the Catholic Church, of course, doesn't surprise us on the one hand, and yet this joins the key issue. Is the Bible really true? And that's what we're going to take a look at. How did we get the Bible, and what is it really? Where did the texts of the Bible come from? How did the so-called canon, that is the authoritative uh, version, uh, get defined? Are the manuscripts reliable? And how accurate are our translations? Which version is best? And that sort of thing. How do we really know that the Bible is the Word of God? That's what we're going to deal with. You and I live in a time of authority crises. There's parental authority being challenged in our homes, marital authority being challenged in the courts and elsewhere, political authority everywhere being challenged academic authority, ecclesiastical authority. All these things derive, of course, from a basic concept of truth. It's interesting to notice that if we take any of over 80 indicators, social indicators, most of them were improving up until about 1963, and then they started to deteriorate rapidly. Divorce rates escalated. Families broke up. The acceptance of homosexuality became commonplace the advent of teenage pregnancies, the murder of inconvenient babies and crime rates. All these dramatically change in 1963 and following. Why? What happened that year? That's when we outlawed the Bible in our schools and in our culture. You know, there are actually only two worldviews that one can hold. One worldview says everything that we experience is simply the result of some kind of cosmic accident. The other view is that what we experience is the deliberate result of a creator. There's really only two views. There are variations of each of these, of course. We all get confronted with four basic questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And to whom am I accountable? And depending on your worldview, that will lead to your response to those four questions. See, we, the rejection of authority actually had its roots in Genesis chapter 3, right at the very beginning. Genesis 3 opens up, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The first introduction of Satan here in this narrative, the first thing he does is raise a question about the Word of God. Yea, hath God said? The next step, of course, is straight denial. God, you, sh you shall not surely die, and so forth. Only through the accountability to the Creator God, who fashioned human beings for moral obedience and high spiritual destiny, do we experience the results of human dignity and true freedom. Anything other than that leads to anarchy. Most of us have probably heard that the uh, skeptical theories about the Bible. Most of these have collapsed if you do your homework. The fact that the patriarchal accounts in the Bible are actually historical has been doubted by many, but has been corroborated by archaeological and other evidences. Many said there was no den they, uh, it wasn't even writing in Moses' day, and that's been proven to be false. The fact that the Gospels and the Epistles were written in the second century, in other words, 
over 100 years after the fact. And all of these have been shredded and refuted by archaeological discoveries, documentary discoveries, and competent analysis of what we have. So these common skeptic, uh, skeptical assertions are invalid to anyone that's going to be diligent and do their homework. The Scripture says, 2 Timothy 3.16, that's easy to remember because of the 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. A very familiar verse. This, all Scripture, all Scripture, not just certain parts that you might select. If you try to believe those parts of the Bible that you accept and reject the others, then it's you, you're believing in yourself rather than in the Scripture. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now that word inspiration there actually is in the Greek, is God-breathed. That it's not just influenced by, it's actually God-breathed. That these, these are words that God uh, chose and selected. Are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Reproof would be for wrong conduct and correction for wrong doctrine. And as we study the epistles of Paul, for an example, um, we discover that Romans is a, the doctrinal statement on soteriology or salvation, and 1 Corinthians, the reproof of that, and Galatians, the correction of that. The book of Ephesians presents the doctrine of ecclesiology, the background of what is this mystical thing we call the church, and Philippians and Colossians, the reproof and correction for that. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians present the doctrine of eschatology, study of the last things. We discover the more we study the Bible, the more we discover that it's very well organized, specifically for its purposes. And uh, now we have the whole package hangs together. One of the things we should understand that even Peter includes Paul's writings when he speaks of scriptures. In 2 Peter 3, the first 16 verses, it's clear that Peter is regarding Paul's writing on the same equivalence as the collection of the Tanakh that they had in the Greek called the Septuagint version of what we call the Old Testament, that uh, they recognized that uh, Paul's writings were other scriptures. Paul, in fact, cites Luke alongside Deuteronomy, puts them together as scripture in 1 Timothy 5 and elsewhere. The scripture itself declares its divine origin and integrity all through the scripture, and I'll leave these notes uh, the, the uh, passages for your notes to look up, look up uh, when you get a chance. But you'll discover the Scripture itself declares its integrity, that it's all of divine origin. And, uh, and Jesus, by the way, pre-approved this through the Holy Spirit in the Upper Room Discourse in John 14, verse 26. So one of the things you'll discover very quickly, that if you buy any of it, it all ties together. There's no excuse to buy part of it, not the others, because you're, you're causing it to deny itself. If you want to reject the whole thing, then reject the whole thing. But if you're going to accept the thing, you accept the total package because it has integrity. And that's what we mean by that very term. Now, how did this actually come about? Men were specifically chosen and prepared for their uh, uh, preparation of these documents. Jeremiah speaks of that. Paul alludes to that in Galatians. They wrote exactly what God wanted for his communication to the people and through them to the world. And... Uh, we now discover, as we examine the text more carefully, that there are all kinds of messages in the text that disappear if you change one letter. You begin to realize that the Torah, the books of Moses, apparently were given to Moses letter by letter, in effect, whether he realized it or not. And I'll show you some examples of that before we're through. That we have here an integral package and uh, that uh, God superintended, watched over every detail. And uh, now subsequent human transmission is, of course, subject to errors and losses. When man gets in the act, it messes things up. And indeed, when we speak of its precision and its accuracy, we're talking about the originals. As it gets translated and communicated, indeed, there are errors introduced. And that's what we have to be very sensitive to. Now, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament and the New Testament revealed. In other words, it's one book. It has integra in, uh, in, an integrated design. And once you discover that for yourself, it'll change your entire perspective on every passage in the Bible. 
One of the things we find all through the scripture are what would be called in the computer field a macrocode, anticipatory macrocodes. They demonstrate an origin of this message from outside the time domain. History is detailed in advance. We'll discover again and again and again there is an element introduced early that makes no sense except in the context of an event that will occur a thousand years later. In other words, the planting of that idea or uh, concept came from someone who knew what was going to happen well in advance. And uh, the, uh, an example, we'll, we'll encounter many of those as we go through our study, but just to give you one example, when Moses is told to raise a brazen serpent in the wilderness, Numbers 21, they had some serpents that were uh, killing people. Uh, he went to the Lord, the Lord says, raise a brass serpent on a pole on a hill, everyone looks to it, will be spared. And he did, and they were. Now, you can read the entire Old Testament, and that makes no sense. Why would God use a brass serpent, of all things, on a hill? And uh, brass, of course, uh, Levitically is a metal for judgment, but the, the serpent is a symbol of sin. Everybody that looks to the sin on the pole is going to get healed? That doesn't make sense. You go through the whole Old Testament, you'll find no allusion, no explanation. In fact, uh, many centuries later, that brass serpent's still around, they're worshiping it. The king has to take it, King Hezekiah has to take it and destroy it because it was becoming an idol. What's going on here? It will make no sense until you get to John chapter 3 in the New Testament where Jesus himself explains to Nicodemus that it was in effect a symbol anticipating the cross of Christ. As Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. And suddenly the fog lifts. Suddenly you realize that it was a messianic anticipation of Jesus Christ and so on. We find dozens of those laced all through the scripture. And as you discover that, you begin to realize you have an integrated design. You're going to reject it, reject it, but don't accept or reject parts of it. It's a package that hangs together. The inspired canon. The word canon is obviously nothing to do with military stuff. It has to do from the Greek word canon, which means a rule or a standard of measurement. And that's when they speak of the canon, the words that are God-breathed. There are many useful books of those early centuries that scholars study, but they're not God-breathed. That doesn't mean they're not valued for for lexicon or understanding what people may have believed in those days, but they're not inspired by God. The canon are those that were evidenced by the early church as, 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 uh, in a very special sense. This all began with the Torah. The five books of Moses were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, along with the Ten Commandments. That was the first beginning of the veneration of the narrative, the text, and so forth. And the whole idea of the canon is based on two convictions, that the words of the Scripture are God's own words. And secondly, that man simply transmitted what he received. So man may have influenced the form, but not the content. The content was God's. That's the distinction. God's own words. The Old Testament presents it as God's actual speech. In 1 Kings 22, and Nehemiah 8, and in the Psalms, several places, in Jeremiah, clearly the intent is, is the representation is the, these were literally God's own words to whom he was speaking. And of course, the Old Testament specifies and details the Messiah centuries in advance. The Old Testament is the story of a nation that was brought forth to present the Messiah, and the New Testament is the story of that man. And the man is validated by all the details that were anticipated hundreds of years before he was born. Once you establish that who Christ is, he then in turn authenticates the whole package. Christ fulfills the specifications beyond competent dispute, and he then authenticates the Old Testament scriptures having, uh, uh, having established his identity. And so that's our epistemological approach. The first thing you need to do for yourself is to establish the integrity of the design. Not because I told you or anyone else told you. Find out for yourself. Discover that these 66 books, even though penned by 40 different guys over several thousand years, are an integrated message. Every detail is there by deliberate design. And once you discover that, then out of that comes the identity of a person. The identity of Jesus Christ. We know who Jesus Christ was by his fulfilling those specifications. Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion, was a, an excellent portrayal in many respects, a, rem a remarkable piece of work on the one hand. On the other hand, it doesn't really communicate 
who Jesus Christ was. And uh, in fact, the other thing to understand is that the crucifixion of Christ was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. He, he had, that, that's been planned before the foundation of the world, and he faithfully uh, went through that process, that program, for your benefit and mine. We need to understand it was an achievement, not a tragedy at all. And so once you establish the identity of Jesus Christ, he, of course, authenticates the Scripture. The first thing he does after his resurrection is give a couple of guys a seven-mile Bible study, starting from Moses, going through all the way to the Psalms and the rest, pointing out that every word there is, is, references he himself. So that's our epistemological approach. Epistemology being the study of knowledge at scope and limits. How do we know anything? Well, this is the way we're going to deal with this issue. By one cataloging, J. Parton Payne's Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, he catalogs over 8,000 predictive verses, verses that forecast the future, on 1,800 different predictions, on over 700 different matters. This is just one cataloging, but the point is the Bible is prophetic. It's not just a quaint collection of tribal history over the centuries. It is far more than that. It is a, a supernatural in its origin, and it demonstrates its authenticity by manifesting an origin from outside the dimensionality of time altogether. You need to discover that for yourself, however. One of the exercises we do in some of our other presentations, we take just eight of 300, there are over 300 prophecies of the first coming, we take eight of those, the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, the fact that uh, he, he was, would uh, present himself as king riding a donkey, the fact that he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the, the fact that uh, that transaction would occur in the temple and the money would end up finally in the potter's hands. All this was predicted centuries before, that uh, he had wounds in his hands, that he would make no defense even though he's innocent, that he would die with the wicked yet be buried with the rich, and that he would be crucified. These are just eight prophecies, and by ana analyzing the circumstances surrounding each one, we come up with an a priori probability of each one being individual. The, the probability that a single person would fill all eight turns out to be an enormous number. In fact, uh, uh, that exercise, applying uh, combinatorial probabilities, is actually staggering. I encourage you to check it out. The main point is that this establishes his identity probably more, with more certainty than probably any other identity on the face of the earth. I'm more certain that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel than I am of my own name. And I can demonstrate that mathematically, but let's us, for this purpose, keep going on here. The most, and, and those eight prophecies are the easy ones. It skips some of the most amazing ones. The fact that the Old Testament lays out in great detail in Genesis 22 and Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are narratives that are just astonishing in their precision. Psalm 22 reads as if it was dictated first-person singular while he hung on the cross. It opens and closes with his first and last statements, and it describes what he sees as he hangs on the cross, written, you know, s several hundred uh, years before the fact. Isaiah 53 describes the purpose of the cr cross and its achievement with more detail than all of Paul's epistles put together, and on it goes. He has his genealogy laid out in advance, and... Uh, the, day, the precise day that he would present himself as a king to Jerusalem was laid out in advance with such precision that Jesus held them accountable to know that day. Their failure to recognize that day is the reason, according to Jesus' remark in Luke 19, that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So the precision and the accountability is uh, all there clearly laid out in the Scripture. Now what's man's role in all this? From the standpoint of form... The human writers contribute to much to the making of Scripture, the historical research, theological medita uh, meditation, linguistic style, etc. There are figures of speech that were unique to those people. There are over 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices, figures of speech, that are used in the Scripture. So man's role, the, the majesty of Isaiah is one thing, the pragmatic uh, pastoral rhetoric of Amos being another, and so forth. Um, the, the, uh, the uh, personalities of the writers show up in the form, but not in the content. And that's an important distinction. Theologically, from the standpoint of content, the Bible regards the human writers of having contributed nothing 
It was the, the content is God's direction. That's what we mean by God breathed. And the, these are things that you need to explore and determine for yourself, but these are the, what make the Bible distinctive. In fact, as we begin to understand more carefully the, uh, the Bible from an information science point of view, we discover that the integrity of that design of the total package manifests a strategy to uh, avoid hostile jamming. It's interesting that you can't, where's the chapter in the Bible on baptism? Where's the chapter, chapter on salvation? Take some subject, some critical subject. Where's the chapter on that? And you'll discover it's not in one chapter. If you're a communications engineer and you're designing a message system anticipating hostile jamming by an adversary, one of the things you do is you take your message and spread it across the available bandwidth. And that's exactly what the Bible has done. And that's what Isaiah mentions in Isaiah 28. That I've established my truth line upon line, precept on a, and upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's deliberately spread that way because you can tear a, any page out of the Bible and not lose any of the doctrines. You may lose clarity on some issue, but uh, it's, uh, it, the, the whole design uh, has been designed, and it's been designed in anticipation of jamming, interestingly enough. The more you know about communication engineering, the more fascinating that all is. And uh, some of you know I've written a book called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity, which attempts to look at these things from the point of view of an information technologist, from, cryptog from uh, cryptography and uh, so forth. And so I commend that for those that you might have interest in that. But one of the critical aspects in examining your Bible is its authentication. There are many scholars that claim that Moses didn't really write the books of Moses. They were really written by somebody else, some other scribes and so forth, and just attributed to Moses. And you run into those theories and it undermines your confidence. Except the point is Jesus attributes the Torah to Moses. So if Jesus is who he claims to be, then that's authenticated by the highest authentication possible. And uh, anyone that believes in Jesus Christ has no problem in the authorship of the Pentateuch or the Torah. Now, if you, don't, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got bigger problems than the authentication of, of uh, the books of Moses. But clearly, Jesus himself authenticates uh, Moses. The Torah is quoted 165 times directly in the New Testament with over 200 allusions. So the point is, each one uh, validates the other, if you will. And Jesus, on the Emmaus Road, one of his first acts after his resurrection is to give a seven-mile Bible study to two guys uh, in which he demonstrates that Jesus Christ was uh, 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 presented in the Scriptures. And he does this as speaking in the third person. Didn't you know that Jesus was to do this and to this and this and so forth? And a uh, very, very interesting uh, event. He said, uh, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Not just here and there, all the scriptures. And one of the discoveries you need to make for yourself is that Jesus Christ is on every page of the Old Testament. Some very clearly, some very indirectly, but always there. All the scriptures, he says. Jesus said, think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht and a tittle are Hebrew, uh, Hebrew expressions. A yacht is one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. It's just a little mark, almost like a blemish on the paper. A tittle is the little tiny decorative hook on certain of the letters. And this is the, uh, equivalent to you or me saying... Um, one yard or one tittle is the same as saying, uh, what, not the dotting of the I or the crossing of the T will pass. This is a call to literalness. Jesus clearly uh, indicated that we should be taking it very, very literally, very strictly. Now, there's a couple of terms get bandied about, inerrancy and infallibility. What do we mean by inerrancy? That the Bible contains neither errors of fact, that is material errors, or internal contradictions. There's they're called material errors or formal errors in the, in the documentation field. But the point is, we're talking here the originals, what they call the autographs. It, it contains neither errors of fact nor internal contradictions. Infallibility is the subjective consequence of design inspiration. That is, it's reliable and trustworthy 
to all who turn in and search for truth. So those are two terms that are well defined. However, it is subject to imperfect transmission. Inerrancy is attributed only to the original autographs, and it recognizes the potential imperfections inherent in their transmission, copying, translations, and so forth, and also the potential cultural, historical, and rhetorical gaps between the writer and the reader. And there are gaps that can be overcome by diligent scholarship. But the important thing is less than 1% of the scriptures are under competent dispute. Unfortunately, no doctrine of the scriptures depends on any of the disputed passages. There are disputed passages, there are issues that scholars ponder, but they don't impact any critical doctrine. Let's talk about some other terms. Uh, the word Bible itself is derived from the Latin, from the Greek word Biblia, which is diminutive of Biblos, which denotes any kind of written document, but originally one written on papyrus is what it originally meant. Of course, today the term is, uh, has achieved a very high venerated status. The word testament, we speak of Old Testament, New Testament, comes from the Latin testamentum, from the Greek diatheke, which is uh, most of the occurrences in the Greek Bible, actually means it, it means a covenant rather than testament. The word testament really has changed its meaning in modern things. It's really a covenant. It really should be the old covenant, new covenant, but be that as it may, we'll move on. Now the Hebrew Bible, which is what we're going to primarily focus on in this session, uh, the Torah, of course, is the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, the most venerated portion of the Scripture, especially to our Jewish friends. Then a section called the Prophets, the Nevi'im, the former prophets and the latter prophets, and they would include Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings in that category, interestingly enough. And then the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Book of the Twelve Prophets. The Twelve Prophets we call the Minor Prophets, not because they're less important, but they're smaller in size. It's, it's a librarian's term. They're small books. But there's 12 of them, and they would call them the Book of the Twelve Prophets. And then they have the section they call the Writings, Kedavim, the, the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and five scrolls, which include Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther, and also Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So that's the way the Hebrew Bible would be divided up. They have their books in a little different order. We take Samuel and Kings and split them into two, and, and um, Chronicles into two, but basically they're the, essentially the books just in a different order. Then we're familiar with what we call the Old Testament, what they would call the Tanakh. The Tanakh being a an acronym of Torah, Nevim, and Ketuvim. Okay, the Hebrew language. The Scripture says, Genesis 11, verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And I'm among those that believe that that original language was Hebrew, a proto-Hebrew perhaps, but still that it was Hebrew. The Hebrew language has some distinctives that no other language on the planet Earth has. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but clearly that's where it all started. One of the peculiarities of the Hebrew language is that the alphabet itself is semantic, not just phonetic. Most alphabets of most languages are phonetic. If you know the letters and how to pronounce them, you can pronounce the word. In Hebrew, if you know what the letters mean, you can make a good guess as to what the combination means, not just how it sounds. And that's rather remarkable. The Hebrew language is also self-parsing. Meaning that, uh, see, the, uh, all the early languages were written without spaces between the words. That all came later. In the Hebrew, it has five letters that are, have a slightly different shape if they're the last letter of a word. And because of that, it's possible to read Hebrew without knowing the spaces between the letters, interestingly enough. So it's a very different, uh, in some respects, far more advanced language than most people realize. And the language, the, the alphabet, is all consonants, no vowels. It's a, what's called a consonantal script. It's like uh, for building, you have BLDG. We do that all the time. You know, building number three or something, we BLDG. You know what I'm talking about. You don't have to put all the vowels in there. Or boulevard, same thing. And um, the vowels, in effect, are implied. It wasn't till the 9th century A.D. that the Masoretes developed what they call they developed conventions for the way the vowels were always inferred, but as time went on, they saw the need they, to, to to put cues in there as to what how what vowels are missing. They do that by putting little tiny marks above and below the letters. That's called pointed script, and the pointing conventions were developed in the ninth century by the Masoretes. But uh, okay, now. <clears throat> 
the Hebrew language is astonishingly vivid, concise, and simple on one hand, but it's so dense then, it makes it difficult to translate fully. It takes sometimes a two or three times as much space to translate the Hebrew into English because the words carry so much significance on their own. And, uh, and so it typically takes twice as many English letters. Or, or letters. Every Hebrew word is, con is composed from a three-letter root. And uh, the verbs are formed from three-letter roots with forms developed by a change of vowels or by adding suffixes or prefixes. You put a few letters in front or back to to amend what it might mean by itself. The root consonants give Hebrew a semantic backbone and stability that's not characteristic of Western languages, on the one hand. On the other hand, it also leads to wordplay. The verb usage is not characterized by precise definitions or tenses. They, uh, they're very context-dependent. And because it is, that lends itself to wordplay or puns and that sort of thing. And so there's a, a often far more carried in a, in a Hebrew sentence than it would be, say, in a Greek sentence. And now the Greek language is just the, is just the opposite. It's a very beautiful language, rich and harmonious. It's a very fitting tool for vigorous thought and religious de uh, devotion and also argumentation. Because uh, Greek is very, very precise. And it, that gives it a strength and a vigor, the language of argument, a vocabulary style that could penetrate and clarify phenomenon rather than simply describing it. Where, where Hebrew would describe it, with Greek you can get, reach inside and tell what's going on in a sense. And how does it do that? By uh, the, uh, the, the precision, and I'll come to a few things there. The uh, classic Greek, sometimes called the Attic Greek or High Greek, is subtle in the syntax and very expressive in the use of participles. Sometimes it's not even possible to translate them into English there, and capture the full nuances of it. And so this was the culture at its zenith, was the Attic Greek. The Koine Greek, or Common Greek, uh, was the result of Alexander the Great, as he encouraged the spread of the Greek culture. Uh, all, all throughout the world, the regional dialects uh, were replaced by Hellenistic or Common Greek. It's simpler and less elegant than the Attic Greek or the High Greek, but it nevertheless retains most of the strength and beauty of it. And that is what the New Testament is uh, written in, is the Koine Greek. And uh, so give you an example, let's take a Greek verb. The Greek ver every Greek verb meets five aspects. It has a tense, a mood, a voice, a person, and a number. And from the verb itself, you can tell, all co it'll convey far more than just its definition would convey. It'll tell you, in effect, who is performing the action, whether just one or more than one is doing it, when it is done, whether it is single event or a process, whether it is an actual happening, a command, or something wished for. In other words, what we think of contrary to fact, subjunctive, or imperative, and so forth, it uh, obviously includes all of that. And uh, whether the subject of the verb is active or passive, we have active voice or passive voice in the English. The Greek also is a third, where it's both, the optative. And that's what causes many people to misunderstand some of the things in, in uh, Paul's epistles, because they're not sensitive to the Greek uh, uh, syntax. And so a single Greek word can require a phrase or sometimes a whole sentence or even more in another language. So Greek is incredibly precise and expressive. And so Greek and he Hebrew is very, very different. Well, what did Jesus speak? Well, his common language is Aramaic, as Mark 15 highlights. He also spoke Greek, as he did in Mark 7. He spoke initially to Greek, in Greek, to Mary in the garden that morning, until he had, and she didn't recognize him until he addressed her in Aramaic and heard the sound of his voice in the Aramaic. Pilate himself, interestingly enough, personally wrote Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. He apparently knew enough Hebrew because he was in charge of that region. That was his, his assignment. Uh, he spoke Greek because that was the common commercial business language of that day. And he spoke Latin uh, because of it was the official language of the Roman Empire. And as the years go by, it, took, it takes uh, uh, several centuries before Latin displaces the Greek throughout the Roman world. But the, uh, Pilate spoke all three, interestingly enough. Now, there are many non-canonical books. There's a group called the Apocrypha. The word means hidden, by the way. 
and these were formulated about 300 BC to about 70 AD. There's about 13 of them that happened to be included in the Septuagint translation. And they were embraced by the Council of Trent in 1546 as part of the package, but um, not recognized by the church as canonical, they were, but they were in existence at that time. Then there's also a group of the Pseudepigraphia, which are books that ha are, were false. They were written under pseudonyms, and uh, there's 54 of these. They're very curious things uh, scholastically, but not taken seriously by the early church. So you'll run into the non-canonical book. These are books that were not regarded by the early church uh, as inspired by God. They have characteristics that would exclude them from being in the canon. There are a group of books that are lost to history. They're alluded to in the scriptures. The Book of the Wars of the Lord is mentioned in Numbers 21, and there's a whole list of them. The Book of the Just, the Book of the Acts of Solomon, and so forth. These are lost. We have no idea uh, what they said, uh, where they are. They're just illusions. They are lost writings and, and as remain the subject of conjectures by scholars. Um, and there are, from time to time, false versions of these that surface but then are discredited for one reason or another. What we really want to focus on is the Old Testament texts, the Hebrew texts. The original Hebrew was pulled together in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, and it was called the Rolaga as a group. And uh, in 285 B.C., Ptolemy Philadelphus funded the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. In those days, Greek was the standard language of business. Most people, even if you were Jewish, spoke Greek. They used Hebrew much as a Catholic uses Latin. They used it for ceremonial purposes, but many Jewish people didn't really have facility in Hebrew, and they desired to have a copy of their scriptures in Greek. So Alexandria in Egypt was in those days one of the major literary centers of the world, and they funded 70 scholars, some would say 72 scholars, uh, in Alexandria to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And uh, some say there were six from each of 12 tribes to make 72. There's different versions of the details, but the point is the, their, their work product was finished in 270 B.C., from 285 to 270. It took 15 years. And that, the product that they produced is known as the Septuagint translation. Septuagint being simply a fancy word for 70. It usually shows up in an abbreviation LXX, which is 70 in Roman numerals. But that's the Septuagint. And this is a very valuable document for many reasons. First of all, it gives us a precise Greek rendering of the Old Testament. It is also very prominent because the prophecies in, that are detailed in the Septuagint were in black and white virtually three centuries before Christ's ministry. So the existence of those prophecies are beyond dispute. And... Uh, Another reason it's so significant is that that translation became the Bible of the early church. The early Christians used the Septuagint translation, along with the letters of Paul and other letters that were being circulated, as their scriptures. And uh, now, meanwhile, there's a, the Hebrew text. By, by the time you get to the ninth century, the Hebrew text was uh, codified by the Masoretes. These were a group of scribes, and their, their product is called the Masoretic Text. Your English translation of the Old Testament is a translation deriving from the Masoretic Text. And it, in turn, really had its roots in the Council of Yomnia, which occurred about 90 AD. Obviously, the, Israel rejected her Messiah, crucified him. As he predicted, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. That gave Judaism a huge problem because they were taught that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, and they have no way to shed blood when the temple's gone, so they've got a real problem. And they have a council to deal with this, and that council really redefines Judaism into a religion of works and, 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 and of good works and so forth. But they also undertook a revision of their uh, uh, Vorlaga, their, their Hebrew text, and gave rise to what ultimately becomes the Masoretic text, the text that we have in our Bibles. The Council of Omnia, they were upset because the Septuagint was uh, used by the Christians, so they, want, they rejected the Septuagint. They uh, wanted their own Bible, if you will, and so they made their amendments and so forth. 
and they produced the unified text of the Tanakh, and uh, they got rid of anything that didn't agree with it, they destroyed. And that uh, their Tanakh becomes the Masoretic text later. And so, so the Masoretes, these are a body of medieval scribes and Tiberius uh, that were charged with the Old Testament text preservation from about 500 A.D. and codified about 950 A.D., so called the, the, you know, the 10th century. And uh, they're, they're the ones that also uh, invented the way of uh, putting, representing vowels in the Hebrew. And uh, the oldest dated manuscript is uh, 895 A.D., um, and uh, it is only part of the three major sections. The Torah and the Kedavim are missing as far as that particular uh, manuscript is concerned. The Hebrew text today is largely dependent on what's called Codex Leningradensis, and it's stored in the Leningrad uh, Public Library. And it's used as the primary text for most Hebrew texts today. And depending on uh, 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 which Hebrew text you have in your, in your word processor or whatever, it comes from, it'll come from the Leningrad uh, Codex. It was copied about 1008 A.D. from texts written by Aaron ben Moses ben Asher. And uh, we also have a thing called the Samaritan Pentateuch, 4th century B.C. now. It differs from the Masoretic text in about 6,000 places, of which 1,000 need to be taken seriously. And where the Samaritan Pentateuch disagrees with the Septuagint, excuse me, agrees with the Septuagint against the Masoretic, it should be regarded as significant. In other words, you've got a Samaritan text that's 4th century B.C. You've got the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the 3rd century B.C. When those two agree and have something different than the, than the Masoretic text has, which is 900 A.D., uh, that's probably a result, a deliberate result, of the Council of Yamnia, where they've diddled with it. And... Uh, so the two oldest codexes of the Samaritan Pentateuch are in the are 13th century, 12th and 13th century in England, in, uh, in, in Manchester, England, or Cambridge, England. Um, now, there's an Aramaic Samaritan Targum of the early Christian times and an Arabic translation of the 11th century. They also exist. And uh, now the Aramaic Targums, Aramaic became the official language of the Persian Empire in the 5th or 6th century B.C. And... Uh, the, uh, so they, there's a number of translations. One of the most highly venerated of these is what's called the Onkelos translation. And uh, it's among the rabbis highly regarded. And there are some very interesting differences of the Onkelos translation and your King James. An example of that is in Genesis where Enos was, was the, fir the, the first son of Seth was the one that led the... Um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, teaching against God. And it's just the opposite. You know, King James is a mistranslation. It's well known among scholars, probably footnoted in your Bible. A lot of that comes from the Onkelos translation. And there's several others. We don't have to go over each one of these. The Peshitta is a, con is a contra uh, very controversial uh, document. It's an Eastern Aramaic version in common use in the Syriac church. Peshitta simply means the plain or simple version. Uh, its literary history is very complex and problematical. There's a lot of debate exactly um, where it came from and what its history is. And uh, there aren't any big particular doctrinal issues out of this. It's just uh, it has some... Uh, uh, where it really came from is a, a, a point of scholastic dispute. It doesn't affect any of our uh, direct issues anyway. The most important series are the Septuagint, the Greek translations. There's a number of them in papyri, the papyri... Unseal. Unseal is a, a, a style of all capitals and usually without spaces. It's, very, it's, the, way they, it's the way they are. There's hundreds of these, of, uh, in, and uh, a lot of these uh, 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 were found in the 2nd century B.C. and following. Uh, Chester Beatty is one of the most uh, important collections, and that's the, the 2nd through the 4th century A.D. Um, and there's a lot of pre-Christian parchment uh, fragments that are in various libraries. It's about the 4th century that vellum starts to surface, and there are three important um, codexes, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus. All three of these really had their origin in Alexandria, Egypt, and we're going to talk more about them before we're finished. And uh, they are 
among the oldest complete manuscript. There are fragments that are older, but these three are uh, almost complete of the Old Testament, and they're from the 4th through the 10th centuries. Then there's the, the cursive scripts start showing up, the minuscules as they call them, and uh, that's where there's a cursive script. They appear in the 9th century and, and into the medieval period, and there's a long list of these that uh, uh, we don't have to get into, just they're, they're, there's plenty of them around. Um, the Latin versions show up in the 2nd century, under Tertullian and following, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, uh, fragments of the old Latin. It gets translated, because Latin begins to replace Greek in the 3rd century. So Jerome is commissioned by Pope Nemesis I, and he translates the uh, uh, available uh, versions of the Old Latin into what's called the Vulgate, which is the common, commonly used Latin version. And it's really a composite of the Septuagint, the Hebrew, and Latin, and other manuscripts that were available at that time. And then we have a lot of quotes from the early church fathers that, from this period that, are, that impact our Latin understanding. I'll give you a, di a summary of all this in a little bit here. We can't talk about manuscripts without making allusion, of course, to one of the most important finds, and that's the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are 11 caves at Wadi Qumran, over 600 100 manuscripts. 200 of those were biblical. Not all of them were biblical, a lot of other things too. There were 60,000 fragments, many of which have yet to be examined thoroughly. 85% leather, 15% papyrus. In Cave 4, there were 40,000 fragments of 400 manuscripts, over 100 biblical, Every book except the book of Esther was found among those fragments. Uh, there's a number of them at what they call Group 1 at Wadi Qumran and also at Masada. All these predate 70 AD. They all predate the fall of Jerusalem. All of these agree with both the Septu as we understand the Septuagint and the Forlaga. So they're, uh, it's very, very important uh, corroboration of, of the accuracy of what we have in our hands. A second group that are found in a couple of other reasonable, nearby places uh, were hidden after 100 A.D. So these are after the Council of Yomnia. All these agree with the Masoretic text. So it's interesting that the, the difference between the Septuagint and the Verlaga on the one hand and the Masoretic on the other, the dividing between that is the Council of Yomnia, where obviously they made decisions and adopted practices to go a slightly different direction. One of the things that give you an example, I, re, uh, I was doing some research having to do with uh, Ezekiel 38, and I happened to stumble into Amos 7.1. Amos 7.1 in your Bible, from the King James, reads as follows, Thus hath the Lord God showed un, unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. What does that mean? I have no idea. It makes absolutely no sense to me as it stands. If you turn to the Septuagint, that verse looks very different. There came locusts upon the earth. and uh, Let me back up. When you're in the book of Revelation, there's a passage in Revelation 9 which speaks of the locusts upon the earth, and they had a king over them, which is the, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The locusts have no king, according to Proverbs 30, verse 27. Why is Proverbs 30, verse 27 there? So that we'll understand in Revelation 9 that the locusts here are idiomatic. They're not literal locusts. They're demons of some kind, and locust is being used as a figure of speech. So from that background... In Amos 7.1, if you read Amos 7.1 in the Septuagint, it says, Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming, and behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. That's in the Greek, the precision Greek. There are some blemishes in the Hebrew that causes the confusion translation as you find in the, Maser in the Masoretic version. Here in the Greek version, it's pretty clear that the, what's being talked about here are locusts in the demonic sense, because Gog's a king. These, these locusts have a king, which means they're demons. And I can remember when I stumbled into this, I was blown away that, wow, could be, because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, this Gog guy shows up, Gog and Magog, with no background, no linkage. And it's very strange in the Bible to find an important person without some kind of explanation or, or links to him. 
And suddenly it becomes very clear that the Gog is a title of a demon king. In those days I was, uh, uh, had a routine where I would spend my Tuesday nights with Hal Lindsey in a study. I'd do a, a service at his church that evening and then I had a breakfast a Bible study the following morning, Wednesday morning. I'd spend the night with Hal in his home and we used to rap for hours in his study at night. Well, I, I, I was all excited because, wow, here's a, a discovery for Gog that I'd never ran into in, in any of the literature. And uh, Hal dug out his Septuagints and stuff, and we dug out his reference, and sure enough, it's correct. In fact, it's not even a variant reading. It's, it's accurate. And um, um, I was blown away, but Hal wasn't. That, you know, because uh, here's all these people interested in prophecy, and Ezekiel 38 has been studied for, for centuries. And yet, uh, I never come across any remarks like this in any, you know, anything. Hal was not surprised. He said it's a fulfillment of Daniel 12.4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even at the time of the end, for many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many people quote this verse as knowledge in general, but the context implies the knowledge that will be increased is knowledge of prophecy. And Hal's point is that as we get closer to the end times, we should not be surprised to make discoveries that have eluded scholars of the past. And that blew me away. I was very excited. His point was that, Chuck, you should expect that. And so... Um, it's interesting, but again, the key to unraveling the Old Testament was the Septuagint translation in the Greek. And uh, so, the question also comes up now, is the Bible inerrant? Does the Bible have errors in it? And I always, you know, when I was a teenager, I believed in the, believed in the Bible and so forth. I had a, a friend that was the son of a Unitarian minister, so he knew his Bible, but he didn't take it seriously. He said, well, what about Kings 7, 1 seven twenty three? And he'd always throw this at me. Because in 1 Kings 7.23, it deals with Solomon's, this big laver for the temple, which is 10 cubits in diameter, 5 cubits deep, and uh, it has a circumference of 30 uh, cubits round. In other words, everyone knows the circumference is not three times the diameter. And so this is not a big deal, but it's wrong, it would seem, that uh, the circumference is uh, three times the diameter, and, and uh, uh, according to the text... And yet we know it's not three times, it's pi, 3.14159 or whatever. There's this peculiar number of pi that relates the circumference to the diameter. Well, I didn't have an answer in those days, but a ra later, later years a rabbi explained it to me as we were talking about this. If you look at that passage in the Hebrew, the word for circumference is misspelled. And when the Masoretes found an error, they didn't correct it, they made a uh, margin. Uh, uh, an annotation in the margin. The error, the parent error, was called a kathiv, and the corrected version was in the margin called a kiri. And as part of the respect for the text, they wouldn't change it, but they'd annotate what they thought was the correct spelling. Well, the point is, Hebrew is like both Hebrew and Greek. These are two languages that have a distinctive in that each letter of the alphabet has a numerical value, and that is exploited in a number of ways. Under Hebrew alphanumerics, if you take the way the kathiv, the way it was written in the Masoretic text, there's a kaf, a vav, and a he. The way it should be written, normally, is a kaf and a vav. Well, a kaf is about 100, the vav 6, and the he 5. So the, um, the way it is, uh, should be written is 106. The way it is spelled is 111, because there's a he thrown in there at the end of it. Well, if you correct that ratio for the 31 cubit circumference, you'll discover that it's in a length that's about 46 feet, there's an error of less than 15 thousandths of an inch. So it makes that adjustment. Now, some people also point out that that can also be uh, 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 accredited by a hand breath, that that was the thickness of the, of the, of the labor that Palma's building, and so they, they, they don't see a problem there. But there are something else that comes up with all of this that I have to share with you. Um, there are a couple of constants in the universe that are dimensionless. Uh, there are two of them in, in view here. One is pi. It's a dimensionless constant. Pi is 3.14156, or 159, on and on. Um, pi is the same number no matter what, whether you're in metric or English, how, what, whatever units you're measuring, it doesn't matter. It's a dimensionless constant. You follow me? There is another one that you probably have not run into unless you've been in advanced math. If you had a course in calculus or advanced engineering or advanced mathematics, you've come across this peculiar number called E, 2.7183 and so on. 
I'll come back to that in a minute. There are two major passages in the Bible that have to do with the creation. Genesis 1.1, of course, and John 1.1. Well, it's interesting. If you take Genesis 1.1, and you take it in the Hebrew, and you take the number of letters times the, and the product of letters divided by the number of words times the product of the words, if you do that, it turns out you get pi to four decimal places. Well, that's kind of interesting. And, and, I don't know what you do with that. Curious. It's, it's, it's a little bizarre. John Napier, by the way, is the guy, the mathematician that uh, discovered the, uh, the, the properties of this peculiar number E. He actually was an activist for the Reformation in uh, Scotland. Uh, he's the one that uh, first used decimal points and fractions. But he's the inventor of logarithms. And uh, the natural or Napierian logarithms, named after his honor, is log to the base E. It has all kinds of properties in advanced mathematics. You'll find it in wave mechanics, electrical theory, all the distribution of prime number. It shows up everywhere in strange ways. This peculiar number called E, and it turns out to be approximated by 2.718281828182828, so on. Anyway, what's interesting, if you take the other major creation passage, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, John 1.1, 1, 1, and you take that in the Greek, and you do the same thing we did with the Genesis passage, the number of letters times the product of letters divided by the number of words times the product of words, you get E to five, uh, four decimal places. Now, I don't know what you do with that. <laughs> it doesn't prove anything exactly. And yet it's interesting that everywhere we turn, we discover properties in the biblical text that clearly went beyond the understanding of the people that wrote it. There's no way you'll ever convince me that John was acquainted with Napierian logarithms and contrived this. No, this is, this is a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in my view. Along the same line, I'd like to share with you this whole issue, are there hidden messages in the Bible? Big debate these days. The Scripture says so. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, and it's the honor or duty of kings to search out a matter. And uh, a rabbi in the 16th century in his writing said, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. Very interesting enigma that emerges in the ancient rabbinical writings. And this leads to a phenomenon that is known as the equidistant letter sequence. What do I mean by that? I can take a simple sentence. This is just one contrived to be an example here. Um, Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. If you take in this simple little example every fourth letter, it turns out that that is another message. And if you take every fourth letter, it says, read the code. Now, this is just contrived to get across to you what an equidistant letter sequence that in a sentence, you can hide another message by every nth letter, every third letter or fourth letter, some, some particular schema. And uh, mechanically, those are hard to find. There are rabbis that do it mechanically even to this day. But most people today will use a computer to search for these things. Let's take the book of Genesis as an example. And this is the book of Genesis. Remember that Genesis, uh, Hebrew goes from right to left. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right, interestingly enough. Uh, but in any case, the word for Torah in Hebrew are four letters. A tav, a vav, a resh, and a he, which is equivalent to our T-O-R-H in a sense. If you go to the book of Genesis, starting in the upper right-hand corner, Go to the first tau, or T, and count 49 letters. You come to a vav. Then you count 49 letters again, you come to a resh. And then you count 49 letters again, you come to a he, which in the Hebrew spells Torah, okay? Now, you say, well, okay, that's, uh, so what? That could just be that way by a statistical accident. When you go to the book of Exodus, you discover rather astonishingly, the same thing happens. You go for the first tau, 49 letters to the first vav, 49 letters to the first resh, and 49 letters more to the first, to the next, you find a he, and you have, again, Torah. Now, happening twice like this starts to blow any statistical accident kind of theories, because that's pretty, that, 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 that seems very deliberate to anyone analyzing it. When you go to the next book, Leviticus, it doesn't happen, and you almost feel a sense of relief, probably. When you get to numbers, something even stranger occurs. It happens, again, with 49-letter intervals, but it spells Torah backwards. 
Now, you, <laughs> this raises a question to my mind. I, they must have had time on their hands. I don't know how they found this. Okay. And you go to Deuteronomy, the same equivalent thing happens. Now, now it's puzzling. You've got Torah spent, spelt forward in Genesis and Exodus, backwards in Numbers and Deuteronomy, each in 49 letter intervals. Let's go back and examine Ec Leviticus, and we discover not a 49, but 7, the square root of 49, and we find that at seven letter intervals we have the Yad He Vav He, or the Hova uh, or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce the unpronounceable name of God. And now when you stand back and look at this overall design, Genesis, Exodus, it's spelled forward, Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's spelled backwards, the Torah always points to Yehovah or Yad Heh Vav Heh. So, um, now the question is, okay, this is cute, uh, what about it? Uh, there are people that would argue that this just a, is a statistical accident. I don't think so. I think this is the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. And we find things like this laced all through the Bible, different kinds of things. The word Israel, if the, let's, let's search for the Israel in Hebrew. In the first 10,000 letters of Genesis, searching intervals from minus 100 to plus 100, it only occurs twice at intervals of 7 and 50. Now, to a Jew, those are significant numbers because that every Shabbat, they, uh, they cite the, uh, the Kaddush at, uh, in Genesis 1, verse 23 on. The Jubileer after seven smittas and so forth, the 50. Also, uh, and, and, and there's more to it. I'll, I'll leave that go now. Uh, the trees in Genesis 2. In Genesis 1, 29, God said, I give you every herb-bearing seed which is on the face of the earth, every tree which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for food and so forth. At the end of verse uh, chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2, out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life and so on. So from verse one, chapter 1, verse 29 to chapter 2, verse 9, in that segment of biblical text, we find the 25 trees that you'll find in the Bible encrypted in those few, in those, within that space. And uh, uh, so that's interesting. And there are those that would argue, well, that's just a statistical accident, but I don't think so. We also find in Deuteronomy, speaking of the Holocaust, we find Hitler, Auschwitz, the crematorium for my sons, the Fuhrer, Eichmann, king of the Nazis, Auschwitz, several places, Germany, Hitler, Mein Kampf, all these are encrypted there in various places, the so-called Holocaust. In Isaiah 53, we find this, what some people would call the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. We find the Messiah, Nazarene, Galilee, Pharisee, Levites, Caiaphas, Annas, Passover, a handful of other apparently relevant allusions. But the one that's really exciting to me, in Isaiah, in those 12 verses, you have encrypted the people who were at the foot of the cross. You've got Peter, Matthew, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, James. In fact, you find two, James, uh, two Jameses. There were three Jameses, but the third James was not a believer until after the resurrection. We have Simon, Thaddeus, Matthias. We have three Marys there. Indeed, there were three Marys at the foot of the cross. Salome and Joseph. In fact, one of the Marys is encrypted in such a way as it's interlinked with John, by the way. But even more impressive to me than the names that are encrypted in those 12 verses is a name that's missing. There is a name that, is, that consists of very high frequency letters in Hebrew that statistically should show up in that space by just statistical accident. You'd expect to see it just from raw statistics. And in this case, it's conspicuous because it does not appear. That name is Judas, interestingly enough. So let's talk a little more about yachts and tittles. I want to acquaint you with something. Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the law of the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I send to you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. To me, he's calling attention to even subparts of the letters themselves. One yacht or tittle. I want to highlight briefly some characteristics of the Hebrew alphabet. The, the, the Aleph is the first letter of their alpha, uh, uh, alphabet. That's why it's alphabet. It's the very term alphabet is a Hebrew term, by the way. Aleph, Beth is what it, it speaks of. But anyway, Aleph is, on the right side shows how it appears today in Hebrew. Its original presentation before Babylon in, proto in the early uh, Hebrew 
was like a longhorn sp uh, steer. It represented an ox. So the word Aleph is first, first letter. Also represents like an ox, which means strength, okay? The uh, strength or leader. The uh, second letter is a bet. On the right side is the way it appears today in Hebrew. On the left side is the way it used to appear. It looks like a little teepee, if you will. That little symbol gets turned to become RB, if you will, but that's generations later. The bet is, it, it really represents house. House or family, well, that's in the house, the family. Like Bethlehem or Bethel, house of God, or house of bread or house of God. Okay, so if you take an Aleph and a Bet together, on the right side is the way it would write today in Hebrew, but in the ancient Hebrew it would look like, showing you on the left on the slide there, the longhorn steer and this little teepee thing. The, the, the word Ab, that pronunciation, at an A and a B, is Ab. What does it mean? Well, the Aleph means the first or the leader, the strength of, and the Beth is the house. So this means it's the leader of the house. It's the Hebrew word for father. Or if you want to say daddy, it's Abba, but it's Abba is the father. Let's go one step further. There's a Hebrew letter called a He. It's a breath. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, may, it may represent hands lifted up or an open window. There's all speculations of what it originally meant. But in any case, the letter implies behold or revealed. It also is the, implies a breeze or wind or spirit. It's very similar to the H, where it's a breath. Remember Eliza Doolittle in uh, George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, made into the musical My Fair Lady. The, he had, she had to practice her H's in Hartford, Hereford, Hampshire. Hurricanes hardly happened. She had to practice. Remember, all that. the He is a, the Hebrew equivalent of the H. If you put a He in the middle of a word, it's inserting a breath or in, in that word. So Ahab is, is the essence of the Aleph and the Beth is the father. Putting the hay in there gives you the essence of the father. What is the essence of the father? It's the Hebrew word for love. Love is the essence of the father. The point I'm trying to make here is the letters carry the meaning, not just the sound. And that, that, that's, if you... Under the the, the uh, Hebrew department of the University of Arizona pointed out to me that if they teach the kids how to recognize Hebrew in terms of the ancient Hebrew, it takes half an hour to do that, make a list of 22 and learn them. If you can do that, you can. they discover the kids can read about 80% of Hebrew. Because by knowing the letters and what the letters signify, you can make a, a very informed guess of the semantics that, of, of, of the passage. When uh, Abraham and Sarah had their names changed. This is the way they were spelled before their name in Genesis 17. When God changes the name from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, all he did was add a hey in their names. Abraham and Sarah, he in, signifying the presence of the Spirit of God. Well, I want to give you a riddle now. Who's the oldest man in the Bible? Methuselah, good for you. He lived 969. Well, yet he died before his father. How can he be the oldest man in the Bible and yet he died before his father? That's your, little, that's your question for your small group meeting this week. Ask him. And of course, what everybody forgets who his father was, his father was Enoch, who didn't die. He was translated. In fact, when Enoch was 65, something happened that from that point on he walked with God for three, uh, over 300 years. He apparently was given a prophecy See, the, the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. But Enoch was told when his son was born that as long as his son is alive, the flood would be with, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. So he named him Methuselah, which comes from two Hebrew roots. Muth, which means his death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. Methuselah really means his death shall bring. In fact, if you do your homework in Genesis 5, you'll discover that Methuselah uh, was born, and when he was 187, Lamech was born, and when he was 182, Noah was born, and it was the 600th year of Noah that the flood came. And if you do your math here, you'll discover the year that Methuselah dies is indeed the year the flood come. I always ponder this. Can you girls imagine what it was like raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the entire neighborhood would probably panic. But... In any case, if there's all this significance hidden behind, 
the name Methuselah, what about the other ten names in this genealogy in the book of Genesis from Adam to Noah? We have uh, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech, and Noah. The problem with these names is they're not translated in your Bible. If you have a lexicon, it doesn't translate proper names. And um, the way you have to uh, unravel these is to get into the Hebrew roots and find out what the, the, the words mean. And since we learned so much from Methuselah, let's take a look at these others. What does the word Adam mean? Well, man, that's a reasonable good. Adamah means man. His son was named Seth. And Seth comes from a root which means appointed. In fact, in Genesis 4, verse 25, Eve said when he was born that God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. So the word Seth, she even tells us, implies appointed. Seth has a son by the name of Enosh, which means mortal, frail, or miserable. It comes from the root Anash, which is to be incurable, like a wound or a grief or wickedness or what have you. It really means incurable. Kenan is, uh, means sorrow, dirge, or elegy. And uh, his son is Mahalalel. Now, he's probably had enough, because he and his father is named, uh, you know, miserable and so, and so forth. So he decides to end all that. He names his son when he's born Mahalalel. That's a mouthful, but it's a great name. It comes from two roots. Mahal, which means the blessed or praised one, and El, the name of God. Mahalal El. Mahalalel means the blessed or praised God, or blessed God. He has a son by the name of Yared, which is a verb. The verb Yarad, meaning shall come down and... I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Enoch, we've mentioned already, but what does his name mean? It's an academic term. It means commencement or teaching. And Methuselah, we talked about, means uh, from Muth and Shalak, uh, uh, means his death shall bring. And as I pointed out, it, it was, that was the year the flood came when he died. His son is Lamech. And here's a root that we use in the English. And it's still evident in lament or lamentation. It really comes from a root meaning despairing. And Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah before? That's about 70%. Not bad. Okay, I'm kidding. All right. But we use the name, but what does it mean? Well, Lamech explains. It comes from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Uh, Lamech even mentions that when Noah is born, that he shall comfort us and so forth. He explains it. That you can draw these even from the text itself. Well, now let's take a look at this genealogy, with this, having had this little Hebrew lesson. And we have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Let's read it in English. Man, the pointed, mortal, sorrow. The blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death, whose death? God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Every time I do this, I get goosebumps. Here is... What you, a reasonable summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in the early chapters of Genesis. Now, this has several implications. First of all, it's clear that, um, well, let's put it this way. You can never convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah. No way. But it also says something else. It speaks, of course, to the integrity of design. That's why I bring it in here. But it also indicates that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to a surprise that Adam blew it. It was planned before the foundation of the world. That's when God first started dealing with you, before the foundation of the world. He had you on his mind. And here's a demonstration of that hidden in the text itself. For our purposes here, the primary implication is that this collection of 66 books, penned by over 40 guys over several thousand years, is a skillfully designed package. Every detail, every place name, every, uh, every detail, every number in it is there by deliberate design. And the, God always rewards the diligent. If we'll take the trouble to dig in, behind each one of these things will be a discovery. And I leave that with you. One integrated. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. This is an example. And of course, the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I published a book called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity, which includes a background tutorial on cryptography, which of course is what it's all about. Many people writing in this field have no cryptography background. That's really what you need to really understand what's going on. 
And then we deal with microcodes, macrocodes, metacodes, and, uh, and then how to search for them yourself. Um, we do spend some time, but not a lot of time, on the equidistant letter sequences. They're the codes that are so controversial today. We spend out of 25 chapters, we spend two or three on them. But there's far more interesting codes in the Bible, and you don't need a computer to find them. And so I challenge you to take a look at this and find out how you really study the Scripture for yourself. In our next session, we're going to focus on the New Testament itself. How reliable is it? We'll talk about some problem areas and the modern translations that are so controversial in some cases. And I'm going to show you a hidden security mechanism that will assure its authenticity that's been running reliably for thousands of years. And we'll take a look at that in our next session.